All right, let's get started. Lecture 21. Um, we are going to continue our discussion of public goods, corruption, and ethnic uh, divisions today and into Tuesday, and then we'll get into the last couple topics um, for the term. I'm actually going to post problem set three uh, on Tuesday, and we do the following Tuesday, so I just shifted the dates a little bit. Um, all right, any questions before I get started? Great. Okay, so let me start, we're going to shift to ethnic, talk about ethnic divisions, and it's going to relate to corruption and public goods, um, but we're going to focus mainly on ethnic divisions uh, to start the lecture. I'm going to give you a bit of an overview, and then we're going to turn to a paper of mine comparing um, impact of ethnic diversity on communities in Kenya and Tanzania. And then on Tuesday, we'll turn to another paper which focuses on how political institutions, and in particular democracy, may affect ethnic politics. So one thing to know from the get-go is that sub-Saharan Africa is the world's most ethno-linguistically diverse region uh, by standard measures. In fact, we'll have a clicker question just to get things going. And actually, I realized I didn't start up. Sorry, I didn't start up the clicker thing. Hold on. Here it is. Apologies for that. It should appear any second now. Maybe. Yeah. Good. OK, so if you were just to take a guess and you, you know, use the most common measure of ethnic diversity, which I'll tell you about in a sec, out of the world's 15 most ethnically diverse countries, how many are in Africa? Just as a guess to get started. 4, 7, 11, 14. Or I have no idea. OK, so. Most people thought probably 7 or 11. The right answer is actually 14. So 14 out of the 15 most diverse countries in the world are in sub-Saharan Africa. So that's a lot. The only exception is India. So India is what, like the fifth or the sixth. I'll show you the list in a second. Um, but other than India, every single highly diverse country in the world, ethnically diverse countries in sub-Saharan Africa, there are tons of African countries, for instance, maybe the majority, but I should check that before I say it, tons of African countries that have no ethnic majority. There's no one single majority ethnic group. Most other countries, even pretty diverse countries, have an ethnic majority. So what's the measure that's used? Let me tell you a little bit about it. It was developed, um, it was sort of popularized, this measure, by Bill Easterly and Ross Levine. Ross Levine is now a professor here at Berkeley in the Hoff School of Business. Bill Easterly is going to be here tomorrow giving a talk. A, uh, I should actually advertise that. He's giving a talk in Blum Hall, I think at 2 o'clock um, tomorrow. And it's going to be really packed. But if you want to see Bill Easterly, this is your, this is your big chance. Um, so what did Easterly and Levine do in their 1997 paper? They actually took data on ethno-linguistic identity, meaning people's, they, they basically use the definition of ethnicity based on language that people speak or main language that, you know, that they speak, um, which had been put together by anthropologists in the 1960s for every country around the world. They tried to do the most comprehensive job of classifying different ethnic groups. And what they came up with is for each country, the share of the population in that country that belongs to ethno-linguistic group I, P sub I, that's a proportion. So each P sub I is between 0 and 1. And you know, so for instance, you know, in Western Kenya, which you've seen in, in a few papers, the dominant local ethnic group in that region of Kenya are the Luyas. P sub I for the Luya, P sub Luya would be the fraction of Luyas in all of Kenya, you know, which is about uh, something like 14% or 13% for Kenya as a whole. And you can go through and look at this formula and sort of figure out what this ethno-linguistic fractionalization measure, ELF, means for particular breakdowns of population distribution. So you know, for instance, if there were three groups in a country, each of which was a third of the population, and you plug in this formula, you get an answer of 1 minus 1 third squared minus 1 third squared minus 1 third squared, and that's 2 thirds. That's, that's what it is. Um, if there was one group that was, if, you know, so that was 1 third, 1 third, 1 third. If two of those groups were actually a single group, so it was 1 third, 2 thirds, uh, this ELF measure would fall from 2 thirds to 4 ninths, so a little less than half. If there's just one group, P sub I, whatever the group is, that's 100% of the population, ELF is just 1 minus 1 squared, so it's 0. So basically, complete homogeneity is 0. As you get more and more diverse, you move closer and closer to 1. In the extreme, if every single person belonged to a different ethnic group, I'm part of the TED group, there's other groups here, then ELF would converge to 1, because everybody's share would be infinitesimal, you know, 1 in a million, or 1 in the case of the US, 300 million, and that squared is really, really small. Right? How many of you have ever seen a Herfindahl index in any of your micro or IO classes? A lot of people are familiar with that. You'll recognize this as, as basically 1 minus a concentration index, basically. That's what ELF is. So it's a familiar quantity. It actually has a very simple interpretation, which is ELF is the probability that two randomly chosen people in a population are from different ethnic groups. So think about it. The probability that two randomly chosen people are from the same ethnic group is P sub I times P sub I. You were to take, if you were to take two draws from the population and match by ethnic group, that probability is P sub I squared. If you sum that up across all ethnic groups, you get the sum across all groups I of P sub I squared. 1 minus that is the probability people belong to different groups, not the same group. So that's basically where, where it comes from. So what this means is in a, in a country like many African countries where you may have a third, a third, a third as the three population sizes, the chance that two randomly chosen people who bump into each other on the street, say, are from, the, are from different ethnic groups is two-thirds. That's really high. Does anybody have any other questions or comments on this index, or does it kind of make sense? Yeah. The chance from a particular ethnic group, say group I, the chance that two people from group I are the randomly chosen folks is P sub I squared. And you can do that for each different ethnic group. And that gives you the probability that people are from the same ethnic group if you sum across all groups. One minus that is the probability they're from different groups. Yeah, Robin. Yeah, so that's a great question. With these indices, a lot of assumptions are made. The anthropologists just classify people as belonging to a particular group, whatever their sort of dominant ethnic identity is. In reality, over time, especially if there's more intermarriage and urbanization that mixes people together, these kinds of sharp classifications make less sense. Um, but in most of the diversity literature, they force people to choose a group just for simplicity of the statistics, I think. And you know, even in the U.S. Census, you can enter other and you can enter multiple things, but the whole thing is sort of set up to encourage people to choose one group, even though now there's a little more wiggle room in the U.S. Census. Things like that. Okay, so what do ELF values look like? For Tanzania, ELF is 0.93. The largest ethnic group is only like 12% of the population. 
It's just incredibly ethnically fragmented. But lots of other African countries are pretty similar. Uganda, Congo, DRC, Cameroon. You see India up there. India is incredibly diverse linguistically. South Africa, Nigeria, and then you see just slightly below is Kenya. So the largest population group in Kenya is about 23 or 24 percent of the population. Not very much. There's no one dominant group. So um, that's you know this is a list of those top 15 um, countries. Actually, I need to only have 11 or 12 there. Um, it's interesting to compare these ELF measures across regions as well. So the average ELF across African countries, across the 40-something sub-Saharan African countries, is 0.8. The average in Asia is about 0.3. So the kind of typical Asian country, and of course India is the big exception to this, but the typical Asian country has a clear ethnic majority. If you're at 0.3, then if you had two groups, the largest group would be larger than, much larger than two-thirds. Remember we had a two-thirds, one-third example, where ELF went to four-nine. So you know, with an ELF of a third, you're talking about there being sort of a dominant ethnic group. That's the typical Asian country. In the typical African country, there is no dominant ethnic group. That's a big difference. That makes a big difference for national identity. If you have so many people speaking so many languages, the notion of a common nation or common national identity means something very different than if you're in a country where 80 or 90 or 100, nearly 100% 100 of the population belongs to a particular uh, ethnic group. So that's, that's just something to keep in the back of your mind, that this is a very salient feature of African societies. Now, you know, there's a question about mixed ethnic groups. There are a lot of difficult questions about ethnic identity in general. So China is an interesting case. The vast majority of people in China call themselves Chinese, and that's how they're coded here. But there are different dialects spoken in different regions of China that are sometimes unintelligible, meaning they can't understand each other. They're different enough that they're unintelligible. Their writing may be similar. There are some dialects that are closer than others. But from a strictly linguistic sense, you might say, hey, Cantonese and Mandarin are different languages. But you know, the, the definition of dialect um, sort of downplays those divisions. Now, that may play a very important role in politics because it creates a sense of common national identity even among people who speak different languages. Okay? So that could happen in African settings. People might say a lot of the diversity we have there are people who speak different languages that are actually intelligible to each other. In other words, the linguistic differences across some of the African languages that are called different groups is often a lot less than the linguistic differences between Northern Chinese and Southern Chinese languages. But those are called the same ethnic groups. So politics, the strength of national identity and language all combine in sort of unpredictable ways. And it isn't as simple as sort of um, you know, thinking separate languages always lead to separate countries or separate identities. Linguists, there's a, I forget who said it, there's a famous linguist who once said that a language is a dialect with a navy. Meaning, you know, a dialect that has its own army or has its own political power becomes a language. If you're kind of dominated by another group, you're just a dialect. You're, you're not really a language. You don't have that status. So, um, you know, if China split in two and the southern half of China spoke Cantonese, I'm going to bet a million dollars people are, would say Cantonese is its own language as a way to kind of create a separate national identity there. Yeah. Yeah, this definition really focuses on language here. Now, in terms of social identification more broadly, everything else you said matters. Religion matters for social identification. Um, you know, other factors matter, cultural differences matter, but just to be consistent, they focus on language and they use people's own definition of what constituted a separate group and a separate language. So it was really like self-definition, sort of like how the U.S. census, you can define yourself however you want. And that's kind of how the anthropologists did it. But again, you can imagine cases where people who are pretty similar might call themselves members of different groups of the same group. Now, before I mentioned for Kenya, this group, the Luya in Western Kenya, that was the main ethnic group in the studies in Kenya we've been reading. Before the 1950s, the term Luya did not exist. There were a bunch of smaller groups that had different names who considered themselves different ethnic groups. Towards the end of the colonial period, there was a big effort by Kenyans in Western Kenya to organize themselves around a common identity. Their languages were similar, they mostly understood each other, and this notion of a Luya ethnic group was born. Now today, it's accepted as an ethnic group, its own separate ethnic group, but it's 50 years old. And within the Luya, there are different, what are called subtribes that basically have different dialects. Now until 50 years ago, they were called different languages. Now they're called different dialects. So again, there's a lot of flexibility about what's a language, what's a dialect. What is an ethnic group, what is a subgroup? And a lot of debate about that. And that's why some of these classifications are so, so hard. Any other comments or thoughts on this, on this issue? You know, the U.S. case is pretty interesting because over time, the kind of salient ethnic divisions have changed. There have been different immigration patterns. Um, you know, so my parents didn't grow up speaking English. How many people's parents grew up only speaking English in this room as a mother tongue? There's like five people in the whole room. But the vast majority of people in the room, there's some diversity, but the majority of people in the room uh, are American citizens or consider themselves Americans, or at least a large number of people in the room. So that's an ethnic shift. My parents didn't consider themselves Americans, but I do. I speak English. And this is my identity. So things can change very, very quickly in terms of what constitutes a different ethnic group. In earlier periods of U.S. history in certain cities, there were big ethnic divisions between different groups that are all just considered white American groups today, say. But at the time, being Irish or Italian or whatnot was a very salient ethnic distinction in a way that's kind of fallen you know, away over time. Yeah. They do. The same anthropologists measured it. Um, in the U.S., uh, the study of U.S. ethnicity, the, the critical uh, distinction from the beginning of, of settlement really has been, you know, quote, racial distinctions, and that's where a lot of the focus on ethnic divisions are. But in the case of these anthropologists, they focus a lot on language. So they were doing this in the 50s and 60s when there had been earlier waves of immigration from Eastern Europe, from Italy, some from Latin America. So they were focusing on those linguistic uh, distinctions as well. But if you only focus on linguistic distinctions in the U.S., you would sort of miss this incredibly salient division of race, right? So it's a very difficult thing. There's so much theorizing about how we should think of ethnic and social identities. And I think that, you know, the accepted view is that it's really multidimensional. There's religion, there's race, there's language, there's immigration status, there's so many different things. In, the case, in South Asian cases, there's caste. So um, it's complicated. I forget exactly what it is. It's at the time from the 1960s, you know, much higher than European countries, which were much less diverse at the time. But I forget exactly what the number is right now. Yeah. They haven't kind of redone this exercise. So this big global exercise in the 60s of classifying everybody on the planet into some ethno linguistic group is something that others have done in a sort of more partial way since then. Um, but it's, it's an open question. I mean, what is the relevant sort of dimension of social identity in the U.S.? There's a lot of different dimensions you could focus on. And yeah, should, should be should being Italian American versus Irish American be considered a kind of ethnic distinction anymore in the U.S.? I don't know. Right. 
they may be, or they may not be now. So imagine there's a fifth generation Irish American, a fifth generation Italian American, knows none of their ancestors' languages. They live exactly the same. They look exactly the same. They both watch football on Sunday. You know, like whatever. They just do the same cultural, whatever our cultural rituals are in this country. Um, are they really members of a different ethnic group or not? And I think that's that's the question. Maybe some people feel strongly attached to their identity, other people don't. There's a big discussion for those of us of Latin American origin. You know, how meaningful is the whole term Latino or Hispanic? Like for people that come from 20 different countries with very different histories. Um, you know, similar debates obviously in other in other communities. So. Lots of debate. Okay, now that I've basically convinced you that we have no idea how to interpret all these numbers, let's take them really, really seriously for a few minutes. So let's just assume that these ELF numbers for Africa are meaningful, we're capturing linguistic divisions, and I think most people would say, broadly speaking, they are capturing something relevant, uh, at least how people self-identify. What Easterly and Levine do is they look at the relationship between per capita economic growth in, I think, the 60s, 70s, 80s, into the 90s, and they relate that to the country's level of ELF, and then they also try to control for some other stuff, although the relationship is similar whether or not you do that. And they're very focused on this term. Is there some relationship between how diverse, ethno-linguistically diverse a country is and economic growth? That's a pretty important question. You know, they were writing, their paper came out in 1997. Remember, the African growth turnaround only started after about 2000. So they're writing at the end of this like 25 year period of this negative growth. Africa was declining economically. A lot of researchers were trying to figure out why. And they said, you know what? One notable aspect of African societies is they're so diverse. Let's see if that relates to growth in any way. And it turns out it does, and very strongly. On average, the co so the, the coefficient estimate on ELF was minus 0.02, very statistically significant. Now, remember, ELF can go from zero for totally homogeneous countries to one for totally diverse countries. So going from zero to one would imply that African countries, if they went from zero to one, and again, remember some of them were at like 0.9, so pretty close to one, were growing 2% slower per year over about 30 years because of their diversity. That's a huge magnitude. We can make it even more concrete by comparing the average African country to the average Asian country. The average Asian country had an average ELF of 0.3 and Africa, the average African country 0.8. So the difference between 0.8 and 0.3 is 0.5. You multiply that by this coefficient estimate, minus 0.02, and you get an effect of minus 1%. So on average, African countries were growing, according to this analysis, 1% slower per year in per capita terms because of diversity. That's a big effect. 1% a year over decades has a big effect on living standards. This was a very provocative paper. These guys wrote this paper also just a couple of years after the Rwandan genocide, which was based on you know, perceived ethnic differences. The irony there is, even though people are very, probably most of you are familiar with the Hutu versus Tutsi divisions in Rwanda, or maybe you've heard about them, everybody in Rwanda speaks the same language. So in the, this ELF sample, they're like the most homogeneous country in Africa. So again, it just points to the limitations of this index. There was clearly a very salient social division between Hutu and Tutsi, even though they all spoke King Rwanda, or speak, continue to speak the same language. So anyhow. This was very provocative. Maybe diversity has something to do with Africa's poor performance. They go beyond showing the growth results and they try to figure out the mechanisms. So they look at different public policy outcomes in more and less diverse African countries. And they find all these negative effects, in parentheses are the key statistics. Diverse countries have less schooling. In other words, people go to school less. Financial depth means how big is the banking sector. They have smaller banking sectors. Their exchange rates are more distorted. In other words, their macroeconomic policy is more distorted. There's maybe weak evidence that they have more of a budget deficit. They also have less infrastructure investment, fewer telephone lines per person. Of course, this was in the era before cell phones. So these were physical you know, telephone poles and wires basically being strung up. So along all these dimensions of public investment, public policy, like macro policy, financial development, African countries did a lot, African countries that were diverse did a lot worse than African countries that were more homogeneous. That's really stark. And the question is why? Why, why are these outcomes so much worse in diverse countries? So Easterly and Levine have some hypotheses. They talk about why. And what we're going to talk about today in lecture day and also on Tuesday is we're going to get into the details, basically. But their claim is, you know, maybe there are some policies that are good for a particular group, say, but are not beneficial for society as a whole. Maybe leaders can choose one or the other. They can either invest widely in certain infrastructure or they can focus it on their own region. Maybe they can distort public policy to benefit their own group. Or even worse, they can distort public policy to hurt a rival group. So one country we've talked about this term a bit, and we're going to talk about more, Sierra Leone, poor country in West Africa, affected by the war, etc. There was a lot, and I think I mentioned this in one of the first couple lectures, there was a, a railroad in Sierra Leone that went from the country's richest agricultural region to its port in Freetown, a great port, one of the best ports in West Africa. The president, the long-term president of Sierra Leone, Chaka Stevens, didn't maintain that railroad. He let it fall apart, in part because the region where that railroad went was dominated by an ethnic group that led the opposition to him. So by, we by letting the railroad fall apart, he could weaken that region, make them poorer, and less of a threat to him. So you know, there's two ways of thinking about it. One is, oh, there's all these good investments we can make. I'm going to make them more to my group than others, and that's just redistribution. The other one is, hey, I'm not even going to take basic, make basic investments in most of the country, because maybe most of the country opposes me, because they may rise up against me. That's, that's potentially very damaging. So we're going to ask this question, is there a way around this? Is there a way around any negative diversity effects of this kind, taking Easterly and Levine seriously? And we'll talk about two ways around it. First, today we're going to compare Kenya and Tanzania and talk about how some nation-building policies, and I'll make specific in a second, might have helped Tanzania overcome some of these problems, even though Tanzania is the most diverse country in Africa, according to this measure and the most diverse country in the world. On Tuesday, we'll talk about how democratic institutions may either help or hinder uh, this. Yeah. That's an issue that gets a lot of attention, and several authors have claimed that ethnic diversity is most damaging when ethnic divisions correspond to or are correlated with socioeconomic divisions, because then, um, well, the stakes are very high, potentially, uh, for taking power. Um, so that claim has been made. In many countries, ethnic or racial or social divisions do correlate very strongly with socioeconomic divisions. In other countries, less. So in some African countries, they do, and others, they don't. Uh, and some people have studied those differences. My own take on the, the, the study of those issues in Africa, there's no very clear finding on that. But the, conceptually, it makes a lot of sense that it would be a bigger problem uh, when these kinds of economic and, and ethnic divisions correspond to each other. 